this video, I'm going to be building the best value RTX 4070 gaming PC build you can put together right now. If you're looking to access the great 1440p and 4K gaming performance that this card provides without spending a fortune, you're in the right place. I'll be walking and talking you through all the parts that make this build possible as I show you also how to put it together before looking at detailed benchmark and performance numbers later on. Let's do this. At the heart of today's build is this, the Asus RTX 4070. But not just any 4070, the Asus Dual Model. A card designed to be Asus's entry-level design, delivering that 4K and 1440p goodness without costing a fortune. Now, in exchange, you might get some slightly higher thermals, alongside reduced overclocking headroom, though the 4070 does not appear to be a great card for overclocking anyway. I'm very often a fan of these MSRP designs, on the basis that if you spend too much on this card, you might as well get, I don't know, the 4070 Ti or 4080. One thing I'm not a huge fan of though is this really like cheap and nasty packing sort of setup from Asus. But I suppose to Asus's credit, the card has arrived undamaged and in one piece. So that's something. It is, however, quite a good looking card. Fairly lightweight, fairly compact in its form factor. Of course, there's more bleeding plastic. Asus, it's sticking to me. This is going to be the shiniest graphics card ever once I've removed all of this. In terms of design and form factor though, absolutely more than adequate. You get a two fan design, hence the Asus dual cooler name, a nice backplate on the rear and a single eight pin power connector. So no ATX3 PCI Gen 5 style connection on this one, but that's fine as it doesn't take up much power and only needs one cable anyway. I would hazard a guess that this is probably a cost saving thing, but it has the advantage of removing the need for the adapter. The 4070 is a really solid card performance wise. You get amazing 1440p and really good legs at 4k too. In fact, we think this is the best value 40 series card by a long way and one of Nvidia's best value GPUs in years. Coming in at cheaper than last gen's 3080 and a little bit more expensive than last gen's 3070, though with inflation arguably it's actually lower in real terms, there isn't really much that comes close to this design. In fact, there isn't anything that comes close to the 4070 right now. But of course, for a card like this, we need to make sure we get the other parts right. Cheap out too much on the CPU, motherboard, CPU cooler, and you're gonna be in trouble. So let's start, shall we, by installing as many components into the motherboard first as I possibly can. Now this is the Asus ROG Strix B760G Gaming Wi-Fi D4. What a name. Thankfully, this motherboard is a little bit more simple in its overall use case and application than the name might suggest. And if you don't mind me saying so, is bloody gorgeous. Look at that. For a motherboard that's silver and black, it might be one of the best looking designs I've seen in years. Taking a look at some of the connectivity and stuff, we've obviously got some display connections here. We won't be using those. Instead, we'll be using the graphics cards. USB 2, USB 3, 20 and 10 gig USB, 2.5 gig Ethernet and Wi-Fi 6E. We've got another USB-C port, audio, no optical, but that's probably fine for this budget. Alongside cool handy features like a quick release PCI latch, and of course room for PCI Gen 5 M.2 and PCI expansion. This is a micro ATX board, which is gonna save us a little bit of cash and also work well for the compact theme of today's build, but more on that as we progress. As far as the CPU goes, if I can find where on earth I've put the CPU, haha, here we go. I have gone and selected the Intel Core i5 13400F. Strong core count, strong thread counts, decent clock speeds, and a cheap price make it an awesome bet. It's not overclockable, but the cheap B760 motherboard doesn't allow for overclocking anyway, so no love is lost on that front. Plus, on a serious note, you don't really need to overclock these new Intel CPUs for them to be better than their more budget-oriented AMD counterparts. It does upset me that that's the case, but unfortunately it's true, and at this price point, Intel is just by far and away the better option. I'll come back to the CPU cooler in a moment. First, I want to tick off the SSD and RAM. A one terabyte Samsung SSD 980 is gonna provide more than enough storage. We've got read and write speeds in the region of about three gigabytes per second, read being slightly faster than the write, more than enough for a build like this, and enough to alleviate bottlenecks with, of course, those next gen 40 series graphics cards. While I'm here, I'm also gonna just pop in the 32 gigabyte kit of Gale Orion. Now this kit, has got decent enough speeds and because of course it's DDR4, 
it's going to be quite a piece cheaper than the DDR5 options. Remember, if you're going for an Intel board, it will only support one standard of memory to ensure that you pick up the right memory for the right board. In terms of coolant, I can then go ahead and pop this in. This is the Hyper 212 Halo Black. Now, Cooler Master must have made, I don't know, 50 different Hyper 212 variations at this point, but it's not actually a bad thing. It's a really, really good cooler design in terms of the fundamentals, and they do improve it bit by bit. This one's got this really nice neutral black aesthetic, which I love. You've also got black heat pipes, obviously copper on the plate, but black for all the bits that you can see. Fan-wise, you get their fancy halo fan in black. Even the brackets for the fan are black, so amazing attention to detail. In terms of installing this though, all we need to do is add this bracket through the four holes on the rear of the motherboard and then pop these two brackets onto the base of the cooler and screw the whole thing down. A little dab of thermal paste as well will create that nice thermal bond between the processor and the cooler and we can wire it up later on. For now, I think we're ready to move the motherboard assembly into the case. In order to do this successfully, the first thing I'd recommend anybody does with a case is just strip off all of the side panels. Now that includes not only the glass and the rear panels, which are I'm unscrewing here, but also in some cases the front panel, which can also be a bit of a hindrance depending on the config you're installing. And then once the case is laid down flat, I can go ahead and move the motherboard in. Just double check where the standoff holes are on the motherboard. This board is unique in that it has three across the top, two down the bottom, but only two on the middle row. So make sure you remove any of the required standoffs. Extra standoffs are bad news as it can cause issues like grounding out. Something which really is not going to be good for your build in, I was gonna say the long term, but any time you decide to turn it on. Once the motherboard is in, it is now time to pop the GPU into place. Now, as I say, this is a very easy graphics card to install in a case like this one, because there is leaps and leaps of room. In terms of which PCI slots we need to use, you can see these are the really cheap snap-on type. The case for this build is Cooler Master's CMP320, a great budget case, but it does lack a few bells and whistles. In a case like this one, where the PCI covers have already been removed, it's a simple case of sliding the GPU in, lining it up, and applying a bit of pressure. Here we go, that'll clip it in nice and easily. And of course, a couple of screws are needed to stop it wobbling about too much. To power this build up, I've picked up Cooler Master's MWE Gold 750, continuing the Cooler Master theme. And of course, because it's a great standalone unit, it provides really solid value for money. It does so in a form factor that isn't ludicrously massive. It's just overall a nice power supply. It's also fully modular, meaning you only need to plug in the cables you actually want to use. And I'll show you where the cables are we plugging in are going in a moment time. For now, I'm going to put all the right connections in and screw the PSU into the back of the case. It's then a case of wiring up the motherboard cable. This is the largest and goes to the right hand side of the board, followed by the CPU cable in the top left corner and the GPU to the graphics card. You also want to plug in some USB connections, USB 3 to the front panel header, the blue larger and notched design, alongside JFP1 connections. These are really fiddly, so follow the on-screen guide and don't be afraid to refer to your motherboard manual if you're not too sure. Otherwise though, this thing is ready. And actually a really, really simple build for a more novice builder to put together that's still gonna achieve phenomenal performance. How good though? There's only one way to find out. I'm gonna rejoin you for some detailed benchmarks in a moment, but first, it's time for a legendary GeekaWatt montage. <laughs> In terms of performance, I've gone ahead and put this system through a wide range of gaming benchmarks to take a look at how well it stacks up in the most popular titles. For the most comprehensive rundown of synthetic and gaming benchmarks, you can read our full 4070 review linked in the card section now too. In terms of the testing today though, the first game I booted up was a bit of Warzone 2, testing at 1440p and 4K. Now principally, this card is a 1440p oriented design and at high settings with DLSS enabled and set to performance mode, the build clocked in an impressive 118 frames per second on average. Tune the DLSS settings down to balance, for example, and the frame rate will drop a bit, but we think performance is where it's at when it comes to both DLSS and AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution. Move through into Warzone 2 at 4K high settings, jump that resolution up a bit, and while you do lose 20 frames per second, you still knock on the door of that 100 FPS mark. Incredibly impressive from a graphics card, 
card not really aimed principally at 4K gaming. Fortnite was next on the list of games to test out, and here I tested at 1080p competitive settings this time around. Frame rates were once again pretty good, 315 FPS on average to be exact, not much less than what you'll find on a much more pricey 4080 or 4090. You guys tell me that you'd rather test Fortnite at 1080p competitive, which is why we opted for the lower resolution this time around. Apex Legends also stacked up very well, 1440p high settings delivered 167 FPS on average, more than enough to satisfy even the highest refresh rate, 144 and 165 hertz gaming monitors. Overwatch 2 also did pretty good on this system, 4K Ultra, and the game clocked in 135 FPS on average. The reason I tested at 4K here is because at 1440p we were getting something stupid like 200 frames per second, so you might as well clock up the resolution for that visual advantage. Also tried out Battlefield 2042, 1440p high here, DLSS once again enabled and set to performance, and the machine delivered an impressive 125 frames per second on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were solid too, with our frame rate measured using both Nvidia FrameView and MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner. Finally to wrap things up, also booted into a little bit of Formula 1 2022, 4K ultra high, DLSS 3 enabled, RTX on high as well, and the game delivered an impressive 103, more than enough for a racing oriented title, where the visual fidelity is far more important than the frame rate beyond a certain level. The 4070 then, an impressive card that stacks up well, especially in an MSRP design like this one. If you'd like to buy any of the parts mentioned today, they will be linked at the affiliate links down below. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.